the second part of advancing knowledge-led development through the right to science in Africa. My name is Marco Perduca and I'm one of the co-founders and I'm coordinators of Science for Democracy, which is an international platform launched by the Associazione Luca Coscioni based in Rome. This morning we had a, a brief overview of what the right to science is supposed to be, is and should be. And we have had uh, presentations from a variety of international instruments, some a further explanation of how the r science is mentioned within hi international human rights instruments. We heard also from a couple of uh, um, professors from Ethiopia on how, in effect, in Africa, some problems that were raised at the theoretical level are being addressed in a more practical ways, but still with a lot of problems in terms of resources, in terms of lack of regulation or harmonization of regulations around the continent of Africa, with a lot of suggestions that we have taken note of and we will continue in our advocacy work. Uh, Science for Democracy is here today, and once again, Professor uh, Jonas, we thank you for your hospitality to, to, for this day of seminar, mainly trying to link the law and science, but we'll be here again in late February at the African Union to promote a more institutional sort of event in which, in fact, some of the suggestions and assignment, I think what they were called assignment, that we were given today will be brought to the attention of decision makers. Our mission is to try and promote a dialogue between science and decision makers, be they politicians or also uh, members of the, the, the justice system. This afternoon we continue to address the right to science and we also uh, had an overview and, and presentation of how regional instruments can in fact in a way be used so to speak to try and address some of the violations of human rights that may result in blocking research or not allowing people to have access to the latest benefits and, and developments of scientific uh, issues. We understand that it's a brand new theme. It's not uh, easy also to find in, in particular with the most, so to speak, used uh, uh, system which is the European Court of Human Rights, some loopholes or uh, hooks that could be used to promote the right to science uh, in, uh, in this type of fora, but this is why we are here and we also thank all the uh, additional contributions that have been made. Uh, this um, session it will continue to address some of the problems uh, that have to do with the, the international mechanism. And the next speaker is Giulia Perrone, which is a, a PhD candidate at the University of Turin, the Law Department, Research and Advocacy Officer, also of the Associazione Luca Coscione Science for Democracy. We also have to thank the Department of the Law of the University of Turin for having co-promoted and co-sponsored this uh, uh, event, and she will be speaking advancing the right to science through the international human rights mechanism. And after her, we will have Abdi Jibril Ali, who is a senior professor here at the University uh, of Addis Ababa at the School of Law, and will be stand, uh, speaking about standing for the right to science before African courts. Julia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And, uh Good afternoon, everybody. I join myself to Marco and I thank the University of Addis Abeba and Dr. Jonas for welcoming us and the University of Turin for co-organizing this, this session, this symposium. Um, so um, I will be speaking today about the international human rights treaties and I would like to explore with you to what extent we could access these human rights treaties for the advancement of science. Um, in particular, I will be speaking about the human rights treaty bodies of the United Nations and uh, in particular with a focus of course on the uh, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights which is the body that monitors the implementation of the rights enshrined in the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights including the right to science uh, enshrined in Article uh, 15 and I will be speaking about the Human Rights Council special procedures and the Universal Periodic Review. So what are the treaty bodies and what do they do? Uh, they're made up of independent experts. They're not employees of the United Nations. They receive like a daily allowance and um, they have their travel expenses reimbursed because uh, they are not necessarily based in Geneva where uh, the meetings of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, in this case uh, meets, uh, happens. And uh, so uh, they carry out uh, four main functions. The first one is the consideration of state parties' reports. 
what does that mean? Basically, when a state ratifies a treaty, it assumes legal obligations um, to uh, implement the rights enshrined in that treaty, but it's not enough. Uh, it has to demonstrate what action it has taken towards the improvement, towards the full realization uh, of, of those rights. So basically, the state, the ratifying states, is required to uh, submit uh, periodically their report in which uh, they explain what actions, what measures they, they have taken towards the implementation of the rights on restraint. And they can consider uh, individual complaints in certain circumstances, and the procedure of these individual complaints are uh, enshrined in the treaties or sometimes in optional protocols to the treaty, uh, which have to be ratified in addition to the main treaties. And they can conduct country inquiries uh, in certain circumstances. So when the committee uh, receives reliable information and well-documented information on grave, serious, and systematic violation of human rights in a particular country, they can decide to open uh, inquiries in that country. And they write general comments. General comment is the document through which a committee explains uh, what do we mean for a particular right and what kind of obligation arises from that from that right, from that covenant, from that treaty for the state parties to the treaty. But I would like to, to drive your attention on a particular feature of the treaty bodies and on the current context in which they are supposed to, to operate. Because um, each treaty body is responsible for the monitoring of the implementation uh, of the rights uh, set out in a particular treaty only with regard to ratifying states. So basically, um, so only if a it's only if a state is a, is a party so decides to uh, be legally uh, bound by that, by that covenant, by that treaty, uh, the committee can uh, carry out their functions. And this is particularly important here because as you can see, I hope from the map, uh, in Africa there is no state who has ratified all the international treaties, including both uh, the international instruments, uh, including both treaties and the optional protocols. And for example, we have Botswana, we have South Sudan, and we have Mozambique, who have not, who have not ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, in which the right to science is uh, is enshrined. And most of the African countries have not ratified the optional protocol too. Um, also, the current context doesn't really help the treaty monitoring bodies um, to carry out their, their functions because uh, the United Nations human rights mechanism is now facing an unprecedented budgetary crisis due to delaying in payments of some states. Um, very quickly, how does it work? Basically, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, which is the main representative uh, organ of the United Nations, approves every two years the general budget, the regular budget of the United Nations. This regular budget is divided up into a budget for general activities and a budget um, specifically um, destined to peacekeeping operations. All UN member states are required to contribute to this budget according to the size or the strength of the economy. And, um, but in 2019, um, the UN was supposed to receive contribu contribu contributions for um, $2.85 billion. But as of 30 of April 2019, they received only $1.7 billion because some of states are not paying, including the United, United States, which uh, the United States is the main uh, contributing member and is supposed to cover the 22% of the whole budget but is not paying. And this is particularly important for us because the, um, the uh, Human Rights uh, United Nations Commissioner Office of the Commissioner, High Commissioner for Human Rights has decided not to cut staff members because they think that um, this is a temporary cri crisis which can be solved, uh, even if in a recent few years the uh, budget has, uh, faced, has been facing uh, severe liquidity uh, issues. But they think it's a temporary crisis, so they, they don't want to cut staff members, but they want to, uh, well, they have to uh, cut um, the funding for consultancies. And as we said before, the members of the treaty bodies, they uh, are paid on a daily basis. They have their 
uh, travel expenses reimbursed. They are not part of the staff. And what does it mean? It means that they, they, if, they, if they, re they don't receive the funding, if they don't receive the money, they cannot meet. And basically, in April uh, 2019, some of the chairper all chairpersons of the 10 3D monitoring bodies received the, the news that, uh, or the information that their session were likely to be cancelled. And this is what happened. In fact, some, like a few months ago, we as Associazione Luca Coscioni, together with the Loyola University, we uh, tried to submit a report on Italy, but actually we received uh, this respons response according to which the session of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was cancelled or at least postponed. So basically we, we will have to submit it again. Um, so this is very relevant to us because if we lose this, if they cannot meet, basically we lose uh, the opportunity to have the actions of the state properly monitored. And so basically we, we lose the opportunity to understand whether or not the state is uh, working on the implementation on the, towards the full respect, protection and fulfillment of our human rights. Complementary to the treaty bodies, we have the United Nations Human Rights Council Special Procedures and Universal Periodic Review. Uh, the Human Rights Council was established in 2006. Um, it is an inter intergovernmental body uh, made up of 47 states, which is responsible for the promotion of human rights all over the world. And uh, it was established in 2006 with a mandate to undertake a full universal periodic review of the fulfillment of human rights um, all over the world. What is the universal periodic review and what are the, its main features? It is comprehensive, it is universal, it is a peer review mechanism, and it is participatory. Why is it like a uh, revolutionary uh, system of the United Nations? It is universal, which means that it involves like all UN member states regardless of their membership in the Human Rights Council. It is comprehensive, which means that under the Universal Periodic Review, you can monitor the implementation of all human rights in all UN, UN member states, regardless of their ratification status. So this will help us in Africa to overcome the problem that three states here have not, have not ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So the implementation of the right to science in these three countries could be uh, monitored under the Universal Periodic Review thanks to these features. And also it's a peer review mechanism, it's a voluntary mechanism, so basically the states voluntarily, uh, so those willing to undertake this review uh, can basically do that. And um, it's, uh, well, when it was uh, established in 2006, the United Nations w wanted to introduce um, an instrument, a mechanism thanks to which the state could cooperate with each other on a voluntary basis. And it's actually worked because uh, to date, all UN member states have been reviewed at least twice. So we are doing the, the third cycle now. And it is participatory, and this is very important to us as well, because it involves the, the, the participation of not only governments, not only the United Nations, but also the civil society. So we are officially allowed to take part in this review um, and this is very important because sometimes it happens that some, some rights like the right to science, like the right to the benefits of science, or some particular issues like all the issues we are talking about today, we're discussing here today, uh, do not receive attention at the international level, but we are allowed to, um, have to, to contribute, to actively contribute to this, to this review and to basically drive the attention of governments, of our governments and of the United Nations on these particular issues. Um, so very quickly, how does it work? The Universal Periodic uh, Review is conducted by the 47 member states of the uh, Human Rights Council. However, all UN member states can participate to the, to the session. In fact, I was in Geneva last week, last week yeah, uh, to attend the, the session in Italy, and there were 121 countries attending the session and making recommendations to our country. Um, the review is based on uh, three different types of documents. We have the country reports, in which the state basically explain uh, what actions, what steps they have taken towards the implementation of some rights. Uh, we have the compilation of information provided by United Nations agencies, 
And we have a summary of the stakeholders' report, which means the report provided by uh, the civil society, so basically international organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, and, um, and association. Um, so we have like the, there is a plenary session during which the government basically presents the report, and there is the international community uh, made up of the UN member states who can make comments, who can make recommendations to the state, and then the state can decide whether or not they will accept these recommendations according to which they agree on the exigence, on the need to improve, to to, to implement a certain particular. Uh, particular need to, to, to meet particular needs or not. Um, so uh, then there is the national follow-up mechanism and then there is uh, a moment in which there is a midterm report. So basically uh, the universal periodic review happens every four years and a half or five years uh, but in between uh, all stakeholders interested in this review can um, submit their midterm reports in which they start um, the monitoring process of the implementation of, uh, of, the, of the recommendations that the state has accepted during the previous cycle. Um, so it is a very important because it creates a sort of momentum in the universal periodic review in which all uh, governments and, so, I mean, both the government and the United Nations and the stakeholders put documents together in order to check whether or not the state is actually taking action. Uh, towards the implementation of human rights, and and then there is the other uh, the other process. So, Ethiopia was reviewed in uh, May 2019. It received 327 recommendations, but there were no mention of the right of science. And I um, appreciate the fact that the fact that we are still waiting for a general comment on the right of science may have uh, may play a role in this because. Uh, we are waiting for this general comment which will provide us with more interpretation or a clear definition of what what we mean for the benefits of science but still it has a take-home message still it means that we are civil society who have um, a certain background who have a certain uh, documentation who have information on, on a particular topic who have interest and uh, uh, who carry out advocacy activities we can raise awareness in particular uh, on particular topics that uh, do not receive attention. So how could we engage more effectively with the UPR? We can uh, participate in national consultation, we can submit reports to the UPR, we can organize in-country pre-sessions in order to discuss uh, certain topics with the civil society, um, we can attend the UPR session or we can watch it uh, on the um, webcast of the United Nations. And we can carry out advocacy activities like this one, like um, attending or organizing a meeting in which we all uh, share views on a particular topic. And, and we can make oral sta statements during uh, the, last session, the, last, uh, yeah, the last session of the cycle of the UPR in which there is the formal adoption of the report uh, containing the comments on, on that state and the recommendation made to that state. Um, so together with the, in addition to the, to the universal periodic review, we have a special procedures. So the so-called special reporters. They are basically independent um, experts, human rights experts, with a mandate um, to, uh, with, with a fa to, to report and to advise on thematic or country-specific issues. Uh, they can carry out different different activities, of course, and they uh, can um, do country visits, and they can um, provide state with communication in case um, they receive information, reliable information on uh, violations of human rights, and they can conduct advocacy activities to raise awareness again on these particular issues, and they can and they have to submit an annual report to the Human Rights Council. Uh, again, in this case, they sometimes uh, make the civil society involved in the process because they ask for uh, inputs from the civil society, like, for example, uh, the special reporter on the sale of children made uh, did uh, a few months ago with regard to uh, the rights of children born by maternal surrogacy. They basically uh, launched a call for, for inputs to uh, understand what is this, the current situation in this field in the various states. Um, so this has a strong political meaning as well, 
because in um, so the state has to accept the country visit uh, of a special reporter. So this is particularly interesting here in Ethiopia because some of the recommendations received during the last cycle uh, basically uh, recommended Ethiopia to uh, strengthen its cooperation with the special procedures. Um, but Ethiopia did not accept this recommendation. They basically said Ethiopia is committed to cooperate with special procedure on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so to conclude, we do have these ins international instruments and we do have a concrete chance to uh, contribute to the general discussion, not only the national level, not only the local level, but also at the international uni United National level on a particular topic. We do have the tools to have our, ra our voice raised and we think we have this right to contribute, but well, we think we have a kind of duty to do that because it has consequences on our human rights. Thank you very much. Should you have further questions, I'm here. Thank you, Julia. You have to change computer or you? Ah, you never know. This. One of the most um, concerning issues that was raised in the presentation that just ended is the lack of funding for this treaty based mechanism uh, within the United Nations system. And the lack of money has uh, had um, in force the UN committee to cancel the meeting that was supposed to happen to hear from uh, several groups and among others uh, us to co co criticize how Italy is not in fact uh, respecting article 15. So uh, the matter of resources that was raised is the, this morning is also a problem for the United Nations so we can imagine what can happen at the national level. So. Abdi Jibril Ali, Assistant Professor of Addis Ababa University School of Law, will be speaking about standing for the right to science before African courts. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I don't know if I have to stand or sit. <laughs> okay. Uh, most of the things have been said. But the important thing when you speak at the last is that you just have to add some small things because most of the things have uh, already been said. Uh, so what do we mean by when I come back to my topic, standing for the right to before African courts? Actually, I am referring to international courts and quasi-judicial organs in Africa. So I'm not referring to national courts here. Uh, so when we say, how do we claim the right to science in Africa? Uh, one thing we need to distinguish or identify is first, on what basis? What is the legal framework? When I say the legal framework, I mean what are the treaties that guarantee the right to science on which uh, the African courts and the quasi-judicial bodies adjudicate disputes relating to the right to science. Uh, so then the other question is uh, the institutional framework in the sense that uh, what are the institutions, the courts uh, that exist in, uh, in Africa uh, that, that considers of a violation of the right to science in, in Africa. So if uh, I begin with the, the legal framework, we, we have already said in the, in the morning session also uh, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights actually recognizes uh, the right to science in, in Africa. As Julia already said, so in terms of ratification of the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, we accept five states, most of the states in Africa have already ratified. So if, you, if we see the rate of ratification stand is around uh, 90%. So which means that uh, 50 states in Africa provide the legal basis for claiming the right to science in, in Africa. So then if that is uh, the global treaty, I'm, I'm talking about the United Nations uh, system, what about in Africa? So in the morning session also we, uh, we have learned from uh, the presentation that in Africa basically uh, the African treaties do not recognize expressly. So I am referring, so that's why I said there is no express recognition in the treaties that were adopted within the framework of the African Union. 
So they do not refer to the right to science or the right to benefit uh, from the scientific progress or its application in the African treaties, although there are a lot of them. So what option do we have? So the other option is particularly with regard to economic, social, and the cultural right is something that we call implied recognition. So which means uh, that, uh, or something that we call implied, the doctrine of implied right. So we mean that although there is no express recognition in the African Human Rights Treaties, the, the institutions, the African courts, the African quasi-judicial bodies can interpret the rights, economic, social, and the cultural rights that have already been guaranteed in the African treaties, including the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights, can be interpreted in such a way to imply the right to science. Uh, so this is the doctrine that have been followed by the African Commission on Human and the People's Rights, the institution uh, that we have been al already referring to. So if we see that, uh, uh, for example, uh, social rights, right, the right to food, the right to housing, we do not see that expressly recognized in the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights. But what did, what did the African Commission do? The African Commission did that, it say that these rights have already been implied in the African uh, Treaty, in the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights. So if the Commission follows the same uh, ways of interpreting the treaty, so we will see that uh, the right to science can be also uh, implied from uh, the African treaties or treaties that have been uh, adopted within the framework of, of, of the African Union. So if we say that uh, at least, okay, if we assume that uh, the right to science is impliedly recognized in the African uh, human rights system, whether that is the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights, and it is protocol, there are three uh, additional protocols to the, to the Charter, and the African char Charter on the Rights and the Welfare of the Child, then we have at least uh, certain uh, institutions, courts, and quasi-judicial bodies at African regional level or continental level, and we can still identify also some other uh, institutions at sub-regional level or sometime, uh, something that we call uh, sub-regional economic communities. So if uh, I wouldn't spend much on, on the commission, it's what has already been said, that uh, it was established like uh, in 1987. So it's composed of 11 commissioners. It's a quasi-judicial organ. It is based in... In, in the Gambia, Banjul. So it is not here in Addis Ababa, which is the headquarter of uh, the African Union. So it super supervises the implementation of the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights. So by receiving individual complaints from individuals, NGOs, and from states. But that usually, the states do not usually submit cases uh, to, the, to the African uh, Commission. The other is uh, the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and the Welfare of the Child. So if the African Committee of Experts also follows the same doctrine, the doctrine of implied right, it can uh, imply the right to science of children. So in that sense, we can say that, or we can uh, argue that the African Committee of Experts also has a jurisdiction over the right uh, to science in, in Africa. So in terms of uh, composition, the court uh, the, uh, the expert is more similar with, uh, with the commission too, the quasi-judicial organ. Uh, it has 11 members, and, but it is based here in, in Addis Ababa. But in terms of uh, the, the number of state parties to the African Charter on the Rights and the Welfare of the Child, they stand at 49, but a bit uh, lesser than uh, the, the, the Charter. So the other organ at regional level again is the African Court on Human and the People's Rights. So this was established to complement the protective mandate of the African Commission on Human and the People's Rights. So in terms of the states that are a party to the protocol that establishes the African Court, the they standards are around 30, so uh, around 25 states are not yet party to the protocol, which means that the court doesn't have jurisdiction over, over those states. Uh, in terms of its location, it's uh, Arusha, Tanzania. So it's not here in Addis where the headquarters of the, uh, the AU organs are based. Just like the commission and the committees, the judges are 11. Uh, so basically, now the court is a human rights court. But in the future, if 
there are two additional protocols to the, to the protocol that establishes the court. If those protocols come into force, probably the court is going to have additional sections, one on international section, another on criminal section. But for now, it is a human rights court, particularly as uh, Lina already said, it has uh, the court that has widest jurisdiction in, on human rights, we may say. Uh, for example, if we take the inter-American system or the European system, they usually monitor the implementation of the treaties that, establish, uh, that establishes them or the European Convention or similar. But if you take the African system or the African court, it adjudicates cases concerning a violation of, for example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and the Cultural Rights. So probably it is the only, uh, the, I, I think if we add the ECO was court also, we, we come uh, later, uh, that has a judicial organ, that has a jurisdiction on uh, International Covenant on Economic, uh, Social, and the Cultural Rights. Uh, so in that sense, it has a wide uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so the, that, is, that are continental judicial and quasi-judicial organ that have uh, jurisdiction over the right to science. So whenever there is a violation of the right to science, whether that is because of state action or inaction, uh, we can bring the cases to these inter, uh, judicial and quasi-judicial organs and uh, we may find a remedy. So in Africa, another structure is something that we call sub-regional economic communities. So at continental level, we have the African Union. So, but at regional, sub-regional level, for example, in the west, in the east, in the south, in the north, and in the center, we have something that uh, similar to the African Union, but which operates at lower level in terms of number of states. Uh, so for example, uh, this includes the economic community of West African state, or East African economic community, or the Mara, uh, or what do we call SADAC, Southern African Development Community, or COMESA, the economic community in the Eastern and the Southern Africa. So from these, some of these communities, regional economic communities, have their own judicial organ. Some establishes human rights jurisdictions, others do not. But in, uh, for example, if we take the Southern African Development Communities, it used to have something that we call SADAC Tribunal, which was um, uh, unfortunately disbanded uh, because it showed a lot of acti activism in human rights. So because of that, the Southern African Development Communities just, they come together and they said, no, we don't need this uh, uh, court or tribunal anymore. So that's uh, how uh, it happened. But if we see, for example, in the Eastern, Eastern African uh, community, there is the court, East African uh, Community Court of Justice. So that court, in principle, is supposed to have a human rights jurisdiction. Uh, but in the treaty that establishes the court, framed the court in such a way that the jurisdiction of the court become effective only if an additional protocol was adopted. So that protocol didn't happen, so as a result, the East African Court of Justice doesn't also have uh, human rights jurisdiction or it doesn't actively uh, consider uh, that jurisdiction. An exception is the economic community of uh, the West African states. So uh, the, there is a court that was originally established to interpret ECOWAS laws, I mean laws that are passed by economic community of West African states, but in 2005, uh, the court came to assume human rights jurisdiction. So as a result, now they can, the court can also entertain cases involving any human rights treaty. So it is similar to, in one sense, the African Court on Human and uh, People's Rights because it entertains human rights cases so far as it exists now. The African Court examines cases involving human rights so far as that case arises from any treaties. Uh, just like that, the West African Economic Community Court of Justice can also see adjudicate cases arising from uh, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, meaning that it has a direct jurisdiction of that treaty. So as a, uh, as a result, well, what do we have in general? 
is that in in Africa, so the, when when I say these 18 states, I am referring to the states over which whether the ECOWAS Court of Justice or the African uh, Court on Human and the People's Rights have a jur direct jurisdiction in the sense that they can directly adjudicate violation alleging uh, the violation of Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So how they become 18? 15 are from the West African uh, Economic Community or West African uh, uh, states. So ECOWAS uh, Court of Justice, 15 are from there. So three uh, the other states, one Tunisia, Malawi, and uh, Tanzania, they also give access to individuals and NGOs. So NGOs and individuals can directly access, in addition to West African uh, Court or ECOWAS Court of Justice, the African uh, Court on Human and the People's Rights. So as a result, before 18 states or in 18 states, the right to science can be brought before international courts directly and can be, uh, they can be claimed in that sense. But with, with the remaining 36 states, if we exclude Morocco, because Morocco is not a party to any human rights treaty in Africa, because Morocco itself joined the African Union in 2017, so probably we expect that Morocco will also ratify uh, other, other treaties uh, that were adopted within the African U uh, Union. So when we take the remaining sorry, six African states, apart from uh, 15 member states of uh, uh, ECOWAS and three states, one Tunisia, Tanzania, and Malawi. So the remaining 36 states, we can still claim that, at least although we're not sure how the, uh, the African Commission or the African Committee of Experts or uh, the African Court will take, but we can still say that the, uh, the right to science is uh, indirectly justiciable. So I mean that uh, the African Charter or the protocol to the African Charter on Human and the People's Rights, the African Charter on the Rights of uh, Welfare of the Child can be interpreted in these 36 states to include the right to science in Africa. But the remaining 30, uh, 18 states, Article 15 can be directly claimed uh, before these, uh, these quarters. Uh, so those are what, what uh, I prepared and uh, uh, try to say in, in short. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Are there any questions about these uh, additional examples of how, in fact, the right to science or many other rights, but in particular economic, social, and cultural rights can be addressed within the African system? All right. So I thank both speakers. And I understand that uh, we have now the, the final session, which is about palliative care in Ethiopia. And I will invite Michael Abiyu and uh, Salem Mengistu, if they have, yeah, okay, please come up. Uh, palliative care for non-communicable diseases and injuries is the topic uh, that we have, uh, we can, uh, want to address. And if Ephraim Abutun has also arrived, uh, please come up, the experience of hospice in Ethiopia. We decided to have this specific session on, please, you have a... to have this specific session to make an example of how uh, we heard this morning the list of uh, um, essential medicines that should be provided to everybody. The list of essential medicine was uh, prepared by the World Health Organization some 40 years ago, and it hasn't been updated too much recently. Among those, there are certainly uh, painkillers. And painkillers, um, as the, the World uh, Health Organization says, are known by 20% of the population, while 80% of the remaining population in the world has never heard, not even the name of a painkiller. But within this 20%, 80% of the painkillers in the world are used only in North America, parts of Europe, and Oceania. That's it. So it's less than... Uh, uh, a, a billion people that have heard of it, but within this billion people, they all live in these countries that were also the countries in which uh, the professor this morning told us there has been the most uh, significant investment in this uh, 
um, in this field. So we have a problem with the, okay, we'll try to solve the problem first. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, my name is Ephraim. Um, I'm actually a clinical officer or health officer, you can say it, by profession. I work with Hospice Ethiopia as a, a director and palliative care worker currently. So I have been practicing palliative care for the last um, nine years. Um, so today I will try to just, you know, cover some sort of uh, overview about palliative care, what it is, and some uh, slides will talk about um, the needs. And finally, I will talk about some of the milestones of palliative care in Ethiopia. And I will say a bit about hospice Ethiopia as well. Um, so to begin with, what is palliative care? So according to the WHO approach, uh, in which um, uh, it improves the quality of life of patients who are suffering with a life-threatening life illness. Uh, and it encompasses uh, four aspects of um, uh, the individual, like the psychological. We call them actually four pillars of palliative care. Uh, the physical aspects, psychological, social, and spiritual. So in order to say that you know, uh, an organization or individual is providing palliative care, these four uh, aspects of um, the care should be integrated and should be uh, available. Uh, in other way, we can say that it's a care that is given for people who, are, who have uh, a non-curable illness. Uh, and the ultimate goal of palliative care is to improve their quality of life and to keep, their, uh, to keep them comfortable and manage their pains and symptoms and provide support system for their families. So this is just simply an introduction um, uh, of palliative care. Um, who needs palliative care? Um, so as uh, you might be familiar, uh, people who have life threatening illness like that of cancer, it, uh, or, um, organ failure like heart failure, uh, HIV AIDS, um, uh, cardiovascular disease like hypertension, stroke, any um, neurovascular uh, disease, and chronic respiratory disease. So these are um, uh, some of the uh, diseases that would benefit uh, from palliative care. Of course, uh, nowadays the definition and the scope is being broader and it should be available even for, uh, for people who have um, um, acute illness for that matter because you know, they need um, different kind of uh, care and support like that of uh, pain management, even if they have um, acute illness. But in most of the case, uh, people who have incurable illness, uh, like, uh, like listed here, uh, would benefit much more. Um, just uh, to come up with the milestones in Ethiopia, um, uh, so, Hospice Ethiopia was introduced uh, or established in 2003. Well, actually, the history might begin in 2000, um, where you know we had HIV epidemic in the country, and the need of palliative care was really uh, huge. And at that time, some NGOs and the government were to provide some sort of supportive care, actually, but they call it palliative care. Of course, supportive care is part of palliative care. Uh, but the concept and uh, the care was introduced in 2000, um, uh, Gorigol and Kanda. But in 2003, Hospice Ethiopia was formally uh, established. And in 2006, the Minister of Health, in collaboration with uh, uh, like, uh, um, organizations like PFAR and the CDC, uh, they, uh, they started to implement um, or began a scale promotion of palliative care because uh, um, the discipline was new for the country, so associated with the HIV, it started to be uh, introduced. And in 2007, the first national pain management guideline was developed. Um, so, I mean, 
because it was the, the the concept was new. It was not really easy even the, for the government to acknowledge palliative care. So the people who were uh, working in palliative care uh, wanted to you know to start with pain, just like as it's for the segment of uh, part of palliative care. And so at, at that time they developed um, the guidelines for palliative for palliative care for for pain management. Sorry. And in 2010, morphine syrup uh, has been produced uh, in the country um, because you might you might know that you know morphine is like a paramount or a backbone for palliative care. Uh, it's really 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 difficult to practice palliative care without morphine. So we 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 had produced uh, morphine in 2010. It's it's called Etiomorph uh, by Ifar. Uh, in 2010, uh, uh, palliative care was included in the strategy of NCDs uh, because uh, you know most NCDs like that of cancer um, need palliative care. So that you know strategically, we wanted to incorporate it uh, in that document. Then, in 2015, palliative care was introduced in the national um, NCD action plan by uh, Federal Minister of Health. And in the same year, uh, palliative care was adopted as one of five pillars of Ethiopian healthcare uh, policy. That was really, really a big step onward uh, because the government would pay better attention if, if, they took, if they took it as if it is their agenda. So uh, in the same year, uh, there, there was uh, an initiative which is called Pain-Free Hospital Initiative which was uh, run by uh, American Cancer Society. And of course, Hospice Ethiopia was involved in the training. Um, so that was really also really um, important uh, achievement in the country because it, it was possible to train many doctors, nurses, health officers, uh, pharmacists for that matter. And of course, specifically in pain management. But that was a kind of entry point for us to introduce about palliative care. Uh, in 2016, uh, we've printed a dissemination of palliative care guidelines. So now it's available. Uh, well, I think it's, it's developed in uh, 2014, but it has been distributed in 2015. Um, and in 2016, sorry, in 2016, it has been distributed. So in the same years, um, there, there, it has, uh, there is a program which is called Palliative Care Hub. So the total concept of uh, this hub is to train medical workers in the hospitals, health centers, uh, and at the health post level, and uh, to integrate the care from the community up to the, refer to the referral hospitals. Uh, so that you know, the doctors, nurses can see patients uh, in their day-to-day -day practice. And the ultimate um, goal was to integrate palliative care into the existing healthcare structure. So um, I would say this is one of the most important programs that has been uh, uh, just relatively successful because um, at least healthcare providers has been really introduced the basic concepts of palliative care through the training. And about nine hospitals has been sensitized and trained on palliative care and some of them have been really implementing very good. Uh, some are not, of course. Um, so, and the training has also um, involved regional hospitals like Bahadar, uh, Hawasa, Harar, uh, Makale, uh, so, so that you know, uh, the service can be expanded into uh, the regions as well. So, um, Hospistopia has been a partner uh, with this program so that you know, um, the doctors can see patients in their um, hospitals and health centers, and if the patient needs uh, home-based care, then they will refer the patient to Hospice Ethiopia. Then we'll uh, take the responsibility and give the service. So who are we? Who is Hospice Ethiopia? Uh, uh, Hospice Ethiopia is a non-governmental organization established in 2003 by a nurse called Sister Tegerdais Fossen when she was trained in Uganda by diploma in palliative care. And then she came to here and she, she wanted to start and there, there was no any place, you know, 
to practice palliative care for her. Then uh, she started to think, you know, establishing um, a palliative care organization for the country. So even currently, it is uh, the only organization providing palliative care for more than 100 million people. So still, you know, um, we are, we are, we, I would say we are small in number if you take the healthcare prof professional who are trained in palliative care and giving the service. So generally our programs, uh, uh, we provide the service, a uh, holistic service uh, uh, in, in the patient home, one, uh, where we give uh, pain management, we do, we do symptom management, and we provide psychosocial support as well in order to address the total pain of uh, the patient. Uh, we also give our service through outpatient care for those patients who can, who can walk, they come to our clinic and get the same service we give at home. Um, and we give also training actually, because you know, we cannot really uh, meet the need in the country just by only providing the service, so that we give a short course training uh, or short term training for various kinds of uh, healthcare professionals and community volunteers. Um, and we do also some uh, work about awareness raising because still uh, the level of awareness, be it in the community and in healthcare workers about palliative care is still at the infant stage. Uh, so we do different kind of um, uh, activities uh, on television, radios. Uh, so that is generally what we do. Uh, I, I think we, bef before I just uh, finish, I would like to say that you know our our vision is to be center of excellence for the country uh, in the provision of palliative care because we have got the expertise and we have got the experience uh, and you know we, we want to be like um, a training center, a training center um, so that you know any any interested people, healthcare professionals, researchers. Um, can use Hospice Ethiopia to develop um, palliative care uh, for the country. Uh, so currently, um, palliative care is um, considered as uh, an essential health care, even in Ethiopia, health care service. So I think there are uh, four pillars in our um, health care policy policies. So palliative care is the fifth one. If I try to mention just the uh, prevention, curative, rehab, um, and palliative care is one of the five pillars of healthcare policies. And it's been um, an essential healthcare service of uh, the country. And um, um, the International Society for the Study of Pain uh, for Palliative Care uh, and pain relief as a universal human right. So, now, pain relief is not something like, like, you know, we give them as an option, but it is a human right, which means that anyone who has pain needs to, uh, or needs to have access for pain treatment or pain management. So every healthcare professional needs to really uh, treat pain appropriately. But of course, you, we, might, we might develop this uh, uh, um, issue just through, this, through discussion. Uh, the gap is really huge. Um, when I do my master's degree in public health, uh, I try to, to assess what is the practice of pain management uh, amongst, of course, specifically to medical doctors and what is the awareness, level of uh, awareness and the perception and what are those factors affecting uh, managing pain uh, in the country. So generally, I would say majority uh, more than 60% um, of medical doctors do not treat pain appropriately. And, um, well, there are several factors, but among them, most of factors affecting for healthcare professionals to manage pain is a poor level of awareness, and uh, there is poor uh, training in pain management, and it still is not in the curricula, if you take, of course, palliative care in general, it's not in the curriculum of uh, medical school. So these are some of the factors that affect for uh, poor level of uh, uh, pain management. And given the above information, 80% of people in developing countries like Ethiopia uh, estimate require palliative care according to WHO. So this is just generally for introduction of palliative care. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, why we change? The next speaker will be Mr. Zalem Mengistu, who is the program manager of Matthew Woods Wundu Ethiopia Cancer Society. Let's try and see if it works. Okay. We change. Okay, good. All right. Ephraim uh, just spoke. So, Michael Abiu, who is the monitoring evaluation officer of Mativos Wundu Ethiopian Cancer Society, who will be speaking about palliative care for non communicable diseases and injuries. Uh, we understand that Ethiopia is. Uh, very much ahead of other countries in terms of uh, strategies and, and documents. Then at some point we would like to know if uh, all those documents in fact are starting to bring about changes. I think that is only for Mac, so you have to change computer. Apologize for the inconvenience. I now we don't have the let's try. Sorry about that. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Abiyu from Matthews on the Ethiopian Cancer Society. Oh, okay, I have to stay so close. Okay. Is it audible now? Okay. My name is Michael Abiyu from Matthews on the Ethiopian C Cancer Society. I'm a monitoring and evaluation officer at the one and the only well known organization in Ethiopia. some kind of problem with the problem. So I don't think that the PowerPoint is not working. So I'll try to present it for just from here, and I think it will be fine, right? Yeah. So the my presentation outline is mainly on what Matthew Sondu is, the background of Matthew Sondu, and also I'll try to explain the concept behind palliative care. Actually, Mr. Ephraim has mentioned a lot about palliative care, so I'll try to mention some point about palliative care and what palliative care is is going on in Africa and also the challenge behind palliative care and what we have to do or the way forward, how we can do after this is my outline for this presentation. So, Matthew Sundu Ethiopian Cancer Society is an organization which was established in 2004 with a person named Mr. Wondu who lost his son because of cancer. Uh, and now 
Matthew Sundu is registered in uh, with CHSA with Charity of Science, Charity of uh, Society organization, which has the the mandate to register any organization, NGOs in Ethiopia. So currently we are working on pediatric cancer care and support and also on women cancer, mainly on breast and cervical cancer. And also we are working on tobacco control activities. We have these projects in our hands that we are currently implementing. So I think uh, Mr. Ephraim had mentioned what palliative care is, so I don't think that I have to repeat it again because WHO has given uh, palliative care a definition as an approach that improves the quality of life of a person so that they can live a happy life and a quality life throughout their lifetime. That's what WHO gave. To be uh, more specific, on palliative care worldwide, WHO mentioned that only 40% of patients are receiving palliative care worldwide. And most of them, among this number, most of them are in developed countries, not in developing countries. So we, we are lagging a lot behind. I will show you much more on my next slide. So the over all goal of palliative care is to reduce or eliminate discomfort of the patient and also to improve the quality of life of the patient. Actually, palliative care are five goals, and the other one is to improve the mood of a patient and also to decrease fatigue and decrease the pain of the patient that the patient has. And the study shows that in order to increase the quality of life, there needs to be a decrease in the system burden. So a study shows that a person who, re who receives this palliative care showed that there is a reduced by 66% of the reduced in system, which in turn which in turn the increase the quality of the life that the patient has. So I think Mr. Ephraim also mentioned this one because palliative care has four roots, physical, psychological, spiritual, and also social roots. And when we come to the physical, the physical pain that uh, the palliative care has the psychological support that the patient needs, the spiritual support that the patient needs, and also the social support that the patient requires. I think Mr. Ephraim has mentioned that, so I have to pass on this one. I just want all of you to take, I don't know that if this one is visible. Is that visible? I just want all of you to read this one for one minute, because it shows how palliative care is much more important for all the patients in the world, not only for Africa, but also for the whole world. Take one minute. Oh, I, th I don't think that is visible, right? Oh, okay. So this is a nurse in Malawi, she, she mentioned this, these things about palliative care. She said that, I can remember seeing the first patient who was ever referred to me when I started palliative care in overcrowded, under-resourced government hospital. I walked into a side room on children's ward and saw a teenage girl lying on the mattress, wasted, semi-conscious, morbid. Her grandmother was sitting in, in the corner of the room. I wanted to run away. I could not think what I had to offer in this hopeless situation. But, but then I determined to look at what I could do rather than 
what I could not do. So we told the grandmother to clean her dry mouth and apply some GV paint for the trash, for, for the rush. We found an extra pillow and used one grandma's clothes wrapped to make the bed more comfortable and adjusted her position. We explained about turning her regularly to prevent her to prevent bare sores and gave some cream to put on her dry skin. We encouraged the grandmother to sit close and talk to her even though she would not talk back. It seems like a small thing, but they they showed that we were not given up, which in turn helped them that they are not make them feel that they are not alone. See, this shows that you know, if we are not giving up, on, if we are not giving up on the patients, they think that they are not alone. They think that they are supported, so which makes them feel like there is a hope, even though they are dying. They are, there is a hope. So this is something that the Malawi and uh, the Malawi doctor did to to help her patient. Uh, in her hospital. So let me show you what has been going on in Africa. Actually, I will. Sh I have selected some African countries to uh, to know how palliative care is going on. So let me start with Egypt. Egypt, actually, in 2015, the total population is around nine, 90 million, and there were only 10 palliative care service going on in the hospital. And also, in that time, only 1,600 number of palliative care cared in 2016. There was only two uh, educational curriculum was incorporated on the nursing curriculum. Even though there was no medical school giving this uh, palliative care, there was a nursing school who gave uh, this palliative care as mandatory or optional uh, curriculum. There was, when we go to the, the policies of Egypt, they have two policies, national guidelines. They have two national guidelines on management of acute uh, and chronic pain, also management of other physical uh, symptoms. They have these policies. I'm just showing you this uh, this one so that you can see the difference that it has with Ethiopia. Okay, I'm not showing you just randomly. Just I will show you this this country so that you can compare it with Ethiopia. How how we have been doing for the past decades in Ethiopia. So let me go to another countries and show you the experience of South Africa. South Africa have 160 palliative care or hospice service in, in 2016. And they gave around 40 number of palliative care service. 40,000. And when you come to their education, even though they have not included in their nursing school, they have included it in their medical school uh, as mandatory or optional service. So they are doing good uh, at this sense. They are on their policies, they have National Palliative Care Cancer Program. And when we come to Kenya, the total population was around 50,000 or 45 million. And they have 70, seven or palliative care or hospice service and they gave 3,000 number of palliative care in 2016. And surprisingly on their education they have any kinds of curriculum in their nursing and also in their medical curriculum. All of them and they are doing so much than it actually uh, 
on palliative care. When we see the, uh, their policies, you know, they have the National Patient Right ca Charter that the palliative care is included, and also they have a person dedicated to work on palliative care in the Ministry of Health of Kenya. So when we come to Ethiopia, I think it will, it will show you how we are lagging behind. Even though our total population is so much high, we only have like seven palliative care hospice service, and also we only give like 1,000 number of palliative care in 2016. We don't have, we don't include care. Nursing or medical curriculum, we are becoming a problem for the country. So that means we don't have any kinds of professional uh, on this palliative care. If we have the national palliative care guideline, as Mr. Ephraim said, we have like a national palliative care. But we are not doing on the education. So why, why are we lagging behind? What is the problem? The problem, as I said, is the one, one thing is, one, one problem is only on the education, as I said, and w there is also a drug in availability or minimum drug availability. There is also um, lack of la health professional. Lack of health professional, and also there is a voluntary professional uh, problem, and also awareness of the population is minimum on palliative care. So can we improve on that, on this one? Yes, because the experience of Uganda and also Kenya shows that we can do better if we work on palliative care. Actually, even within ten, 10 years, we can improve on that. For instance, Uganda, in Uganda, they work on only for 10 years on palliative care, specifically, and they try to manage, uh, to increase the government uh, commitment and also to, uh, to dissolve the problems regarding on the drug availability, and also they work on the education part as well. So even though that is it is a good ongoing process, they try to solve some parts on palliative care. So if they do it, there is no means of that we can do it. There is, the room is, the room is open for all of us, for all Ethiopians to improve on palliative care so that we can give a quality life for a patient uh, living with different kinds of disease. That's my presentation, thank you very much. Thank you. Last speaker is Ella Mengistu, who's program manager of Mahi Was Wundu Ethiopia Cancer Society. I think one of the issues that was mentioned in the in one of the last uh, chart is that the lack of opioids, and this is exactly one of the problems that the entire world is saying. Now we cannot call opium or morphine a latest development of science because it has been with humanity for uh, thousands of years, but certainly we could also construct a case as a possible violation of uh, the right to science because of the lack of access to this basic component of palliative care. Now we're back again to the... If you can start and then we'll start, we will see how to... afternoon. Thank you for providing this uh, session. Uh, so I'm Zalala Mengstu from Matthew Sundu Cancer Society and I've been working as a program manager for the last uh, five years. Uh, and this society is already introduced by uh, Mikhail, our MND officer. So we have been uh, engaging on uh, uh, pediatric cancer for the last more than 15 years. 
and also we have been working on uh, breast and uh, cervical cancer on prevention care and support projects. And also, uh, we are working with the Ministry of Health on non-communicable diseases and its risk factor, particularly tobacco and alcohol. So my session also focused on non-communicable diseases. This afternoon, uh, so what's non-communicable diseases? These are chronic uh, disease conditions uh, with a very prolonged course or timeline, and they are not usually uh, spontaneously resolved. And usually we don't achieve a complete cure, but really we can achieve. And to mention some of the uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, cardiovascular heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, cancer can be mentioned as uh, non-communicable disease, but the list is long, uh, such as chronic mental illness, violence, injury, even aging are considered under non-communicable disease. And uh, usually, non-communicable diseases uh, are not considered as uh, communicable, but uh, frankly speaking, non-communicable diseases are also communicable. They can transmit from one person to another person. Let us say, if you look at cervical cancer, it's 99% is caused by viral infection known as HPV, and it can be transmitted from one person to another person by sexual intercourse. So uh, we can say non-communicable diseases are still communicable. If, if you look at violence and injuries, they can uh, spread through social networks, social medias, such as Facebook, as we observe in our country. So non-communicable diseases are uh, communicable, despite it seems non-communicable. So globally, we do have four major uh, non-communicable diseases. Among these, heart diseases are the leading cause of mortality globally, followed by uh, cancer, and then we have also diabetes and chronic lung disease. Th these are the major global uh, NCDs, and these NCDs uh, are caused by four major risk factors. The first one is tobacco use, and the second one is analgesic diet, and physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol are the major risk factor for the four major major non-communicable diseases. And as you can see from this matrix, tobacco is the predominant cause for almost all major NECDs. While analgesic diets uh, cause heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. So we have been working here in Ethiopia on uh, tobacco control for the last uh, four or five years. And now the country has uh, ratified a very stringent tobacco control uh, proclamation which expect to reduce uh, demand and supply of tobacco in the country. And many uh, African countries are also doing the same uh, because of the uh, global uh, framework convention on tobacco control. Uh, when we look at evidences, as I said previously, cardiovascular disease globally are the leading cause. It is the same true here in Ethiopia. Uh, we have a study conducted in 2016. It's NCD step survey revealed cardiovascular disease as the leading and they are also increasing and cardiovascular disease are followed by cancer. Uh, currently, Ethiopia is in, uh, in a condition what we call double burden, double burden of disease. Uh, that means there is a high burden of mortality due to NCD as well as uh, communicable diseases such as HIV, TB, malaria and so on and uh, maternal uh, problem, maternal and child problem, and also nutritional problems. So the country is in, uh, in uh, what, what so-called in, uh, uh, in epidemi epidemiologic transition, as well as in double burden due to this non-communicable and communicable diseases. When we look at the different global uh, policy change, when it comes to the NCD, there are so many milestones. Among others, the WHO ratified uh, the first framework convention of our control in 2003, 
and the first UN political declaration on NCD is uh, ratified uh, on 2011, and the Millennium Development Goal was a missed opportunity to address non-communicable disease. It was fully focused on communicable disease, but now the global agenda, which is a sustainable development goal, will address uh, the non-communicable disease and also its risk factor. Uh, and we have some best buys, some best buy interventions, very cost-effective interventions for non-communicable diseases. Among others, for example, acting or uh, making a policy change on tobacco use is one of the best advice. Uh, for example, we can raise tobacco tax and decrease demand, and also we can uh, create smoke-free environment and uh, warn the danger of tobacco as well as uh, uh, and also enforce 100% uh, tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship activities. So if you do if if you do this, we can uh, reduce uh, significantly the demand of tobacco. And when when it comes to alcohol, harmful use of alcohol, again we can uh, raise tax and also re restrict access and also enforce alcohol advertisement. Even we can you can see in our country. Before the current new proclamation, there was a lot of advertisement through the media, uh, al alcohol advertisement, advertisement by different companies. But right now, uh, alcohol advertisement is totally banned through the, particularly through the broad broadcast media. And also, energy diet and physical activity we can reduce salt, reduce trans fat and po polyunsaturated fat, and promote public awareness. And also on, uh, again, we, we have also cost-effective in intervention for cardiovascular problems. And also for cancer, we have vaccination and also infection prevention. Because most of the cancer infection, most of infection in sub-Saharan Africa cause cancer. So we can work on immunization and infection prevention. So this figure shows for you the cost the direct and indirect cost incurred by non-communicable disease. It's around, the estimation is from 2011 to 2025, it's around 7 trillion US dollar. You can imagine how much this money is. This is caused by, this is caused by any cities. But government, governments can avert all this catastrophe by investing only 170 billion US cities. So, uh, NCDs cause a huge amount of uh, economic loss. And uh, uh, due to that, governments now uh, reflect very well the NCD agenda under the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3. And uh, as I said previously, there was a missed opportunity under the Millennium Development Goal. However, however the Sustainable Development Goal it has well addressed this uh, non-communicable disease and uh, it's clearly indicated in its targets and also it's under its indicator. For example, uh, if you look at the tobacco, it's well addressed under target 3A. And also other issues such as essential medications, vaccines are also addressed under target 3B. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I was wondering if there are questions for the panelists. Otherwise, thank you again for coming to this afternoon's session. I'll invite you to go back to, res to your seats. And I invite Marco Capato, who landed uh, early this morning from uh, Milan, to be with us. I would caution uh, on the issues uh, to be used to try and discourage the use of tobacco imposing taxes. Italy has been imposing 60% of the taxes on cigarettes and that hasn't been a, 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 a way of trying to reduce and contain the, the use of tobacco cigarettes. So there are other products that are being introduced in the market, but we can speak about that later on. Marco Capato is uh, treasurer of the Associazione Luca Coscioni, is uh, one of the co-founders and coordinators of 
Science for Democracy, has been a former member of the European Parliament for 10 years. To you, the microphone to conclude today's discussion. Thank you, Marco. More than conclusion, just uh, a congratulation for the speakers, for the quality of the work of today. And um, being remained more or less among us, I profit from uh, the podium just to uh, insist on uh, the idea that uh, this occasion was not a theoretical one. Um, it's not uh, supposed to be a conference just to have an update on what the right to science is or could be, or uh, what uh, uh, the possibility of, of access to international court uh, uh, currently is, or which kind of possibility. Um, uh, our goal is uh, much more practical than that. And the last panel helped us in understanding how concrete the needs related to health can be. Um, it has already repeated uh, more than once that included in the right to science is not only the freedom indispensable for scientific research, but also the right to enjoy the benefits from scientific freedom and its application as a human right, as a universal human right. So what does it mean to us uh, as, uh, I would say, political activists that if this right is written down on paper, now we have to do what we can do to have this right applied in concrete terms. And um, it was particularly illuminating the debate of today in understanding, uh, for me, for example, because I didn't know, um, the many ways that are possible in addition to the access to the United Nations treaty bodies about the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, I, the lesson that I learned today is that there is an African way. There is an African pattern that we could try to go through in order to have the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific freedom and its application respected. So what we should do in concrete terms, I think, and the relationship with the, the school of law is a key factor on that, we should build a network of uh, professors, academics, but also students that could uh, take uh, this issue as a, as a priority for their thesis, for their academic work, and try to connect the juridical world with the health uh, world, the operators of the health uh, and healthcare system. And we should try to bring that case when uh, the right to health and the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress is not respected, to bring that cases not only at the United Nations in uh, Geneva, but also uh, at the African level, the African Commission on Human Rights and the African Court of Human Rights. Um, in February, we will have the World Congress for Freedom of Scientific Research here in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. So I think the debate of, the day of today is helping us to to state some very concrete goal for that meeting. First of all, to try to improve the rate of ratification and also signature of the additional protocol. So this is a political goal addressed to government in Africa to ratify the covenant and for those who did not uh, sign the additional protocol to sign the additional protocol to allow direct as access to the um, commission 
on uh, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in Geneva, but also to reinforce uh, the possibility and to, to, to make easier the possibility to bring a case uh, here uh, at the um, African Court on, uh, on Human Rights. And, uh, but this is not only an issue that we want to bring to a political level, to governments, we need to involve th this objective also, people that are um, working with health, with providing health and healthcare around uh, Africa. For example, on palliative care and, per and pain relief. So uh, this is why I think that the different panel session uh, integrated very well one with the other. Uh, we have already, we, we, we have also built up a system that we propose, we will propose to the, the School of Law and also to the Ethiopian Bar Association to adopt, which is a system based on artificial intelligence, a chatbot, to help people to know their right and to have uh, correct information to bring a concrete case, for example, to the African Court on Human Rights or to the uh, Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. And there again, we need the concrete cooperation, not just the, the theoretical debate, the concrete cooperation with academics, lawyers, and students, and uh, health care operators in order to do that in uh, the most effective possible way. So I also, as Marco already did, um, invite you to subscribe on the website scienceforddemocracy.org. Uh, I hope that uh, we will keep in touch and uh, that we will find uh, the concrete way for uh, um, go on with this, uh, with this project. Uh, the Congress on Freedom of, of Scientific Research in February will be the occasion to invite, uh, well, Nobel laureates. There is already someone uh, who um, confirmed his presence here in Addis Abeba. Government and also uh, NGOs, uh, students and lawyers. And I think we could, uh, uh, we could uh, um, obtain some uh, very concrete results. So thank you very much for the occasion of today, thank you to Marco and to all the people who make uh, who made this occasion possible. Thank you. Thank you. I also extend again the thanks to Jonas Birmeta for his uh, hospitality and the, the presence of the students this morning. I hope many of those, and I think at some point we had a hundred people in the room, will subscribe to the newsletter or through you perhaps we can share the videotaping of today's event. Thank you to all the speakers, to the Associazione Luca Coscioni, Science for Democracy. Everything will be available at the end of this week online, but we'll let you know. Goodbye.